Hey everyone, uh, I'm Philip. I work at Fission, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, well, not a certain data transfer protocol in particular, but more like about a bunch of data protocols uh, and how they compare. Um, I think Hannah gave a great overview this morning about different kinds of ways or uh, design goals that uh, data transfer protocols can have. And I'm gonna do somewhat something similar. Uh, so maybe some repetitions, I'm sorry about that. Um, anyhow, well, let's not get, ha get ahead of ourselves. Um, basically, uh, when we began at Fission and we were thinking, well, data transfer and IPFS, well, what do you do? Well, you use IPFS pin. So we would have a server, we would have some clients, and when we want to transfer data, we would pin from the server and fetch stuff from the clients. Um, this turned out to be not amazing sometimes. I mean, we've had the story a bunch of times. So bit swap is behind IPFS pin, and that can be uh, difficult sometimes because of various issues, uh, DHT issues, connection management, and lots of ones like, uh, I think, yeah, uh, that was mentioned in a previous talk also. But I, this talk is not about DHT issues. This, I mean, this is the data transfer talk, not or track, not the uh, content routing track. So. Um, let me talk about the transfer issue, which is basically what we found is, well, you fetch the root block in BitSwap, then you find more CIDs at the client, then you uh, fetch more blocks, and it continues. So you have a bunch of round trips. Um, how do you get rid of this problem? Well, you do batching. And so most of the data transfer protocols that we see today uh, that people are building are basically uh, trying to solve this by a batching. But it's not obvious how. Like, do you use bigger blocks? Some protocols try that. Do you send car files? Well, they're not bigger blocks, they're just a bunch of blocks uh, together. So yeah, um, if it's not that obvious, let's talk about some of the design goals you could go for, that you could aim for um, when you build a new data transfer protocol. So we've already established we want to have few round trips uh, in our protocol. Um, but what is also very imp important, again, uh, Hannah mentioned this. I think I heard of this term first time last year at IPFS thing, and I think it's a great term. It's just incremental verifiability. Um, so this is what sets us apart, or IPFS in general, I think, apart from like just normal HTTP transfer, FTP, or whatever. Um, basically, is the data that I got that, I, that was transferred part of what I actually care about, or is it something unrelated? Or I also like to think of it as like the untrusted data buffer size. So you have some buffer that you allocate at the whatever it's trying to fetch, and it, it has some certain size and you don't want to like have too much untrusted data uh, that you fetch, uh, because it might be a DOS attempt, um, it might just be something going wrong, and obviously you don't, you don't want to spend resources on, them, on some data that you don't care about. It's also part of minimizing trust when you like talk to some other peer in the network um, you have a different kind of relationship you need with them. Like, I mean, we don't need to know who we're talking to if all we care about is just a SID. So that's a nice advantage that we want to keep. So that's incremental ver verifiability. Um, uh, another thing that uh, some protocols are aiming for is query support. It's, it's some protocols, again, not every protocol is trying to do that. Uh, so. For example, for graph sync, that would be, well, you have a root SID and you have an IP lease selector or you have a root IPNS, I guess. Or uh, I think a different form of querying would be range queries and files. Uh, another thing that some protocols are trying to solve is deduplication. So when your problem is not actually transferring some data for the first time, but you actually want to sync something, mirroring, right? Uh, that's what Karmera is trying to solve. Uh, or it also crops up when you have a data transfer, a cold data transfer, kind of, but it uh, stops and you need to resume it. Although the resumption, I guess, and we've seen this with the Blake 3 talk uh, this morning, uh, you can also solve this via uh, just querying the parts that you uh, that failed to uh, transfer. Uh, another big thing with deduplication is there are some protocols and some Merkle trees that are really built around structural sharing. So for example, if you have a proli tree or if you have a hand uh, you, and you update this very frequently, you may want to take advantage of structural sharing. And if you want to sync the next version of this hand and you want to only sync the diffs, 
between basically their new version and the last one. And finally, something, and I think this is not something that I thought of in advance, but more like uh, that is a result of the protocols that were uh, built. Uh, some protocols have like a lot of flexibility in what kinds of DAGs they support. Um, for example, uh, do you only support Blake 3, the hashing function? Or do you support like arbitrary IPLD data? Or do you need some kind of ADL pre-installed? Uh, so ADL being like the uh, advanced data layouts in IPLD. Um, so there's quite some like flexibility in the design goals of a data transfer protocol. Uh, and let me just basically run through all of the protocols that we have and try to like figure out where they lie. Um, for that, I have this table. And basically, I'm going to compare like IPFS pin, which is basically bit swap, uh, just sending a car file, uh, then car mirror, graph sync, and the black three and bow stuff. The reason I'm doing this is not only like trying to categorize this and put things into like neat little boxes. It's also like trying to explain why we have these many protocols, because some protocols focused on different design goals firsthand rather than others. I think that every protocol in theory could like try to solve every design goal, but it's just that they weren't tackled in the same order for every protocol. Um, and yeah, like everyone needs to simplify in some ways in order to get to something that is working. So IPFS pin slash bit swap, I just gave it like tick, uh, this works for all the angles except for a few round trips. Because in practice, you get incremental verifiability since uh, bit swap actually just forces you to, I think the, the threshold of like the block size is configurable, but like a conservative estimate of what you can expect is like blocks shouldn't be bigger than 256 kilobytes. And if you uh, build your DAX this way and like in practice, most DAX and IPFS are built that way, then you'll end up um, only having to allocate like a buffer of 256 kilobytes before you can hash it and see, oh yeah, okay, this is the data that I care about. Uh, you also kind of have query support, but you need to do it on the client, where I'm really stretching like the design goal here. Um, but if you think about like few round trips not being the, uh, uh, the design goal, then yeah, you kind of have query support. If you have like a hand, you can fetch one block at a time and you get through uh, and do a certain query. You also get data duplication and DAG layout flexibility again, all without few round trips, which is a big kind of bummer. Um, with car file transfer, so something like, I think Web3 Storage is basically doing this and lots of other places are doing this today, which is like the basic way of doing uh, batching of uh, block transfer. You get very few round trips. Yeah, you just one, one round trip, you ask for something, you get a car file and it's packed with whatever you want. Um, you don't get incremental verifiability out of the box, I guess, uh, but I put in like, Technically, you could put the orange kind of middle in between thing here everywhere because just depending on how you pack your car file, of course you can do that, but uh, this is really just as simple like Im imagine an IPFS DAG export and then serving that over HTTP is basically what I'm talking about here. Uh, and so you kind of get incremental verifiability if you do like a topological sort of all of your blocks inside the car file, um, but it's not technically guaranteed. Uh, someone may send you something that is not that, and I, yeah, I don't know. Um, basically, I, it's not in the car file spec, but whatever. Um, it's very easily achievable. Uh, query support de and deduplication need to, build, need to be built on top, but it's very flexible in terms of the DAC layout. You can put any kinds of blocks in there. Um, Carmera is basically trying to just improve car file transfer. It's literally that plus doing it in rounds, and um, it is not focusing on query because that wasn't what Vision traditionally had, had problems with. Uh, we just wanted to sync data faster. If you have a bunch of updates and you've been offline on your phone for a while and you wanted to sync that, that should be fast. But our DAG structure at the end of the day was unfavorable for that uh, with bit swap, and so it took a bunch of time sometimes uh, to get through all of the levels in our DAGs. Um, and so that's why this is built. It's basically just batching on a different level uh, and a little bit of deduplication on top of just sending car files around. Um, GraphSync, I think, actually like, achieves most of these things. Uh, I think there is an extension for deduplication. So essentially the idea being 
um, you can do a query and you can add like, don't send me any of these bloom filter blocks. I think that works if I'm not wrong. Okay, you can send a raw list of sys that you, that you want to exclude, but you can't actually send a bloom filter yet. But I think like, in principle, you could build an extension. Um, and I guess, again, that's the, it's probably the case for most of these uh, protocols, uh, that you can evol evolve them into uh, like getting at every design goal here. And then lastly, I think very interestingly, the Black 3 and Bow stuff, uh, it doesn't hit a, take a lot of these boxes, but it's extremely fast. Um, so that is great, and it also has amazing incremental verifiability, uh, even in a way that is, I think, very interesting. And what I want to do now, next, is basically, let's look at this and try to see how we can take some of these ideas and just transfer them over, no pun intended, to other uh, protocols, right? Um, for that, let me <laughs> repeat a little bit of what... Uh, uh, Rudiger has talked about this morning. Basically, Blake 3 and Bow is the idea that you have like huge uh, byte arrays that you want to transfer, and you create these, uh, you, you chunk these byte arrays, and you create the this Merkle structure, this binary tree uh, on top of that, where basically here, like every line is this hashes two uh, upwards, and then you send over, um, starting like when you when you want to fetch a SID, you send over starting with the uh, uh, the tree with a, what was it, pre-order, left first, depth first, traversal. Um, and so it ends up being something like this. Basically, once you have the, these hashes, you can verify, oh yeah, these hash to the SID at the, uh, at the, at the top. And so you know, oh yeah, this is, this is the data I care about. And it continues, and uh, again, you can, at some point, you can hash stuff again and realize, oh yeah, this is the data I care about. Um, yeah, and that continues. But obviously, there's some overhead to this, and so the idea that they had and that he presented was, hey, let's just take out like one layer of uh, this internal Merkle tree, and what we get is um, we've uh, reduced some overhead here in uh, what we need to send because we need to send some hashes fewer. That's really cool, I think. Uh, so essentially, imagine, for example, you have... Uh, two peers who've never seen each other, they want to talk to each other, they may not trust that they actually, or the other side actually sends them the valid data. But if they've been talking for a while, if, there, if there's some kind of relationship between them, you may trust for like a lot more data at the same time to be valid, right? So essentially you can have, uh, at the time that you transfer, you can choose the level of incremental verifiability that you want to have. You, because, like traditionally in, in uh, IPOD in general and with uh, BitSwap, we've had to choose the level of incremental verifiability in advance when we wrote these blocks, right? Because we choose the chunk size in IPFS and UnixFS in advance. But what if we could do this every time and choose it depending on what the connection is we talk to? So can we do it? I think, yeah, we can. And the idea is basically this. So let's take some IPLD block. Uh, this is actually like one node and a hand. Um, it's in practice, it used to be like DAG Cbor, but I've rendered it as uh, DAG JSON because that's actually human readable. And so we have a bunch of nested arrays, blah, 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 and we have some data, and then we have like a link to some other block. And so this block isn't actually that big, um, and that means that the basically the ratio of how many hashes appear in it, so how much of the block is actually a hash and how much of it is actual useful data, so to say, is not that good. Uh, and so the block that is actually linked to there is just this small thing there. It has a bunch of bytes, just a, just a byte array. Uh, so what can we do? Well, we can just inline that. And I've just done it like that. So if you look at this, it's basically just taking the thing at the bottom and putting it there where the hash was. But we keep... Um, the original hashing function that was used, we keep uh, the codec that was used, and we have some sort of, sort of special marker that, yeah, this was inline now. Um, think of it like taking the SID and just chopping off the last 32 bytes from the hash in the SID, and instead putting the block there. And again, uh, before someone comes up to me and says like, identity hashes and SIDs, no, it's not the same thing. It is not the same thing because when you uh, actually compute the, the hash of the whole block and on the receiving side, you deconstruct this thing and split it into individual blocks again. 
So where identity, identity sets you can't replace with like the SID that represents the SHA2 hash of what's inside the identity hash SID, uh, this does. And I'm sorry for everyone <laughs> who's not familiar with identity hashes, uh, not that important. Basically, it's something different. Um, but what I, th what I think is pretty cool is um, you can also approach the limit of um, unverified data um, in the, uh, in the unverified data in the buffer uh, from the bottom instead of from the top. Like for example, um, so that is something that Blake 3 kind of did and Blake 3 and Bao. Uh, you can like choose the size all the time or at the time that you do the transfer. But also uh, you could technically um, do the same thing. Like if we go back uh, to this, you could also choose to not like uh, inline all of the bottom parts, but inline the, so let's say the second layer. And instead you have to like send a bunch of hashes um, that you did not inline yet from the blocks below. So imagine like not sending H6 and H7 and not sending H5, but instead sending the hashes in the layer below. And you can do kind of a similar thing in, uh, with, with this idea and with um, IPLE and what you end up with is basically uh, when you send something you agree upon in the in the beginning on like a certain size of whatever the incremental verifiability should be compared to. Uh, and then uh, you can take a block and inline hashes so long as uh, the block is still just slightly below the incremental verifiability buffer size. So that's how you maximize like the ratio of how much hashes you send as in terms of overhead uh, to how much actual data you transfer. But I think it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, for example, if you have, like, let's say, very uh, high frequency write um, data structures, you may end up having lots and lots of small blocks, so you can have maximum structural sharing between revisions, but you can also transfer them on cold calls very efficiently without incurring all of the overhead of all of the intermediate hashes. And I think like doing lots of hashing Blake 3 seems to be like a, a, a case in point that that's not a bad thing to have like small blocks that are hashed together and uh, put into a market tr structure. It can be fast. Um, is this a, like an idea for Carve V3? I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is something for that. I don't know. Um, take it, um, do something with it. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Another idea is, well, queries are kind of like code. And I know that IPVM as a project is uh, starting up. We have FVM nowadays. Uh, so perhaps we can take and simplify um, all of the querying code, which is, has a certain limit today on how like, complex these queries can be, and uh, replace it with code. I mean, this is not the first time that I'm uh, proposing this idea, but I'm hopefully taking it a little bit further. Uh, basically, there's a problem also, I think, with uh, um, IPD selectors and uh, querying, since you need to have these ADLs, so you need to have, let's say, um, every node needs to know about, yeah, you have a HAM data structure, these are the support HAM data structures, and these are the supported uh, byte array abstractions and the chunking methods, and then you need to have some code that knows how to like transform uh, path queries or range queries into these multi-block data structures. And it's a certain set that you need to agree on with all of the peers that are talking to each other. And I think that is one of the problems why uh, adoption has possibly been harder uh, previously. So if you think about it, um, there's people who are coming up with new ways of structuring uh, Merkle data, for example, Crawly trees or different ty types of HAMs and different encodings, and they can't really participate in all of this um, IPLD with ADLs uh, world and IPLD selectors because they would have to convince IPFS implementations to adopt these IDLs. And even like on, on, on the web, on the front end, uh, we don't even have ADL support in browsers yet or in JSIPFS. And so I think maybe there's a way of um, using, let's say, WASM um, uh, to agree on some, something in advance and use that to overcome all of the uh, agreement that we would have to have on ADLs, right? Uh, basically, the idea would be, well, you send some wasm that goes through your block store and collects all the blocks you care about. Um, there's lots of problems with this. So, for example, you need to transfer the wasm file in advance. It can be pretty big. In practice, I guess, you would be restricted to a bunch of 
programming languages which have good tooling uh, to generate small WASM files. Uh, and that's a very small set of programming lang languages. Um, there are some concerns about like, yeah, what if your query runs forever? Um, you suddenly like have something much, much, much more complex. Although I think that uh, queries on their own uh, may have had issues with like how f making them more flexible at the same time makes you more susceptible to DOSing or uh, resource hogging, basically. Um, maybe all of that gets figured out and it's easier once we have IPVM because they need to tackle these problems anyhow. Um, so just throwing that out there. And then if we have queries as code, deduplication is kind of like a query. So uh, basically what you say is, well, I already have a bunch of blocks and I wanna find the diff. So you just write some code that is preloaded with all of the blocks you have, you send it over, and this code basically runs through the remotes state and figures out what the diff is and sends only over the diff. Yeah. Um, and this is, I think, maybe interesting or nice because you can conceptually uh, split data transfer into some pre-processing phase which may be supported by WASM or something like that and then a transfer phase uh, and itself. All right, um, I hope, I think I made up some time. I basically just wanna throw out these ideas um, if you, I'm excited for what's happening, and yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please shoot them at me. So on the uh, Bow Blake three stuff, uh, how does that? Uh, do you still get the same level of advantage if you have a really deep data structure as opposed to because uh, what um, number zero, for example, looks at is sets, so it's really evenly done. What about with something that's uh, narrow and deep instead? Um, yeah, I think that you would need to, I think the, the N0 stuff for now doesn't support that, but the more general idea of just inlining the contents of SIDS could theoretically work that. If you have just a very, very long, let's say, linked list encoded as a Merkle tree, or a Merkle list in that case, um, or call it a blockchain, whatever, uh, what you end up doing is, um, you just inline all of that until you have something that is a big size and you can do it just going down. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't matter what the, what the topology uh, of, of, of that DAG is. I mean, there's some questions around like, if you don't have a linear kind of uh, tree, but you actually have a tree with multiple children, where do you go down first? Do you go breadth first? Do you go depth first? Um, so there are some, some open questions to that, but yeah.